So Easy. welcome uh, to another edition of Zoom Seekers for uh, November 14th. And um, we're going to be talking about marine protected areas uh, tonight. Um, and the cool thing is, I, I, I was fortunate uh, that for 10 or 15 years, I've been sitting on a number of uh, state committees, um, specifically something called the Statewide Interests Group, which is like an advisory committee. <laughs> Um, to the blue ribbon, blue ribbon panels that have been creating all the marine protected areas. That I, I want to say that it's, we have about seventeen percent of the state uh, covered now. So um, California is very innovative in terms of uh, we wanted to create a network of marine protected areas. Uh, and the idea being that it will enhance uh, ocean life. It's not strictly for you know telling people, gee, you can't take anything out of the ocean, but the idea is it makes for a healthier ocean that can sustain take and have good stuff for us to see and everything else. But the guy who knows more about it and is also sort of in charge of overseeing a lot of it down in the Southern California area is our speaker tonight. And that is uh, his formal name is Stephen, but I call him Steve, so we can go either way. But Steve Wirtz from uh, California Department. It's not fish and game anymore. It's fish and wildlife, <laughs> even though it's still the fish and game commission, which has never made any any sense to me. But anyhow, uh, if you'd give a warm Zoom Seekers welcome to Steve Wirtz. And um, Steve, you can go ahead with the share screen and, and off we go. I'm going to mute everybody just so, oh, well, no, I can do it individually. We're, you're all being very good, very good tonight. They only had two people unmuted. There we go. So Steve, take it away. Great. Uh, can you see the screen? I'm okay, seeing great. the notes version. It's the uh, other one. Yeah. Oh, you can see the notes? Yeah, we can see the notes. Oh, well, let me take to stop. Take that know. down and then do the other one. Believe it or not, we actually rehearsed this part of it. He was very good about it twice. Yeah. Um, interesting. What? Let's see. Nope, I still got notes. Wow. And if we end up with notes, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, no, it's not good. Let's try this. There we go. The no note version. Okay, great. All right. Good to go. <laughs> but you can you can still see your notes on your end, right? Yep. Hopefully okay. I won't need to use them too much. Well, there's that. There's that too. I didn't want I didn't want to embarrass you though. <laughs> Off you go. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh I want to thank you all for your interest in learning about California's marine protected areas and thank Ken for all his efforts he's done to, to try to communicate to the dive community and others about the importance of these areas. Um, so today I'm really just going to provide a very broad overview of the program. I'm going to touch on why we have a network of marine protected areas, the planning process, uh, the management program, and a major achievement that we had in December of 22 this year. Um, let's see, it's an advance. So before I get started, a little about me. I, I've been a diver, uh, certified open water paddy uh, back in 1975 in high school. So, you know, that was a long time ago. Um, after that, I spent some time in the Army as a paratrooper. And then I attended uh, Cal State University, Long Beach, where I got my degree in marine biology. And since then, I've been fortunate to work for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And as Ken said, back then it was Department of Fish and Game, and now it's the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I've had an opportunity to work on a wide variety of projects that really helped me achieve a lifetime goal. So I've been involved in research projects uh, below the surface and on deck of boats, uh, responsible for some of the more uh, profitable fisheries like market squid, statewide. I've worked on highly migratory species at the Pacific Fishery Management Council representing California. And then I got into working with the fishing industry at looking at uh, small scale bottom trawl gear impacts on soft bottom habitat, which launched me into marine protected areas management in 2008. So that's, that's where I am now. Um, I'm the senior environmental scientist for the statewide program. And so here we go. Um, you may be wondering, so what the heck, why do we have a network of marine protected areas? Well, this, our story tonight begins 
uh, in the 1990s when West Coast fisheries managers realized overfishing was occurring on some major uh, economically important stocks. And thankfully since then, they've taken action to stop overfishing and rebuild those stocks. But back at that time, uh, they focused primarily on the stock and not the habitats for which they lived in or the communities that they resided. Uh, recognizing as the state legislature took action uh, to create the Marine Life Protection Act. Uh, this act required the state to redesign its patchwork of MPAs that were like protecting a single habitat or a single species. And we had to um, redesign it using best scientific information to create an ecologically connected, connected network. And this uh, applies to California's jurisdictional waters, which occur from the mean high tide line from estuarine habitat and the mainland coast out to three nautical miles offshore and also three nautical miles around the offshore islands, including offshore rocks, which we, primarily those are up on the north coast. The act itself had six goals and those goals helped in the design of the network and they're an integral part of management today. Uh, they're paraphrased in these slides here and I'll just uh, highlight each one of them for you so you get an idea. Um, starting from the upper left, uh, the first goal is to protect biodiversity and the habitats for which they depend upon. Goal two is to conserve and rebuild populations. Goal three is to enhance recreational research, education, activities in areas with minimal human disturbance. Uh, goal four is to protect marine heritage and unique habitats. Uh, with us, goal five requires us to uh, have effective management, enforcement, and use sound science in the management of this network. And of course, the ultimate is this ecologically connected network. And at the time in 1999, this was pretty revolutionary. So the planning process was also very amazing, as Ken uh, can attest to. Um, it was a major uh, public, public, what do you call it, top down, bottom up approach, where stakeholders actually designed the network using guidance from a science team and feasibility inf information from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And at times there was a high level policy team that were non uh, state agency people, but they were people in the business world um, that dealt with political situations, trying to try to resolve policy issues. So these stakeholders uh, were like recreational, commercial fishermen, NGOs, uh, academic institutions, state agencies, um, sanctuaries were involved. And what we did was uh, we formed three teams and we mixed randomly all the participants. So you couldn't have a team with all user groups like tape groups, like spear fishermen and divers. Uh, there would be, it was set up where you'd have maybe an NGO mixed with a commercial fisherman and someone from academia. So it forced them to work together to come up with a sound proposal. And they had to do this through three iterations. And after each iteration, they would come to the science team and the department, share their proposal, and we would provide input to them, and they would refine it. Eventually, everything, uh, the final, the third proposals were given to the California Fish and Game Commission, who took uh, public comment and testimony, heard information, and made final decisions on the marine protected areas. So in the planning, uh, we had several designations that we use. Uh, first is what we call a state marine reserve. This is the backbone of the network. It prohibits any type of extractive activities. And in all of our outreach materials, uh, it's designated in the color red. And we uh, request that all our partner organizations use the same color scheme. Um, however, uh, non-extractive activities like surfing, scuba diving, swimming, playing in the water, boating, jet skiing, there's those non-extractive activities are allowed. So you can visit them. It's just no take is allowed. It's kind of like going to the national park where you can't take a pine cone or whatever. Uh, that's how the reserve is set up. 
The next designation and the most common, uh, numerous, I should say, along the coast is what we call state marine conservation area. And that area uh, that's always shown in blue and um, it allows limited types of commercial and recreational fishing. And each conservation area along the coastline uh, has different regulations. So it's good to have a regulation booklet or one of our flyers before you head out so you know what the regs are. And then while it's still a conservation area, uh, we call some of them, it's only in Southern California, a no-take conservation area. And these are areas that uh, stakeholders wanted to create a reserve, but they couldn't because there was infrastructure. Like in this map here, this is over at Wrigley, Blue Caverns, um, and there's a pier and other infrastructure. And the maintenance of that infrastructure could result in incidental take. So legally, we could not call this a reserve. And that picture on the bottom right is kind of an example of like in, intake pipes uh, in a reserve that would need to be maintained. The next designation is called a state marine park. We only have one of these on the coast. It's up in uh, Cambria uh, and it's always shown in yellow. We do have a few in San Francisco Bay, but they're not part of our coastal network. Uh, and these areas um, only allow certain types of recreational take. No commercial fishing activities or any other type of activities are allowed. And um, they can uh, depending on where a park is, it may have its own types of allowed take for recreational uh, anglers or divers. The next designation we used in our network is called a State Marine Recreational Management Area, or affectionately called the SMRMA. Uh, there's none in Southern California. Uh, these are in estuarine habitats, and um, they're essentially... <laughs> Want, stakeholders wanted to create reserves here, but historically there was waterfowl hunting. So that's allowed to occur, but typically take is not allow, allowed below the mean tide line. They're primarily set up for wildlife viewing uh, to enhance the outdoor experience without any um, other types of activities occurring. And then the last designation in our uh, network is a very small discrete area and it's always shown in pink or fuchsia, <laughs> that color's pink. Um, and these are seasonal closures uh, to protect marine seabird roosting and nesting sites and marine mammal haul out sites. And so these areas, um, is the, these are the only areas where you can uh, not enter. You would need special permission to enter them. Many of them are seasonally when the seabirds or marine mammals are there. Uh, this one's up on the north coast and is around an offshore rock, but uh, a lot of them are on the uh, coastline itself. Okay, so um, planning took place actually from 2004 to 2012, and we did it sequentially across four coastal regions to account for the uniqueness of each of the regions. As you can imagine, Southern California is majorly different than the North Coast. Um, so the first region we did was uh, the Central Coast and that was completed in 2007. And that's uh, from Point Conception, just north of uh, Monterey Bay. Then we moved up to uh, north of Monterey Bay and above San Francisco and completed planning in 2010. Then we headed back down to the South Coast uh, and wrapped that up in early December, um, early 2012, and finished on the North Coast um, in late 2012. So this resulted in 124 redesigned or new green protected areas along California's coastline and offshore islands. And this equated to about 850 square miles. This pie chart shows the breakout. So that 850 square miles translates into 16% of the coastline. And 9% um, of it is in a state marine reserve. And as I mentioned before, that is uh, no take at all. And then uh, the one that's the most numerous made up about almost 7%. That's the conservation area. And the, you can see those other designations don't even make up a fraction of a percent. It, this was a 
this was monumental and it was great for the state of California. Uh, prior to this planning process, less than 3% of the coastline was in a protected area and less than 1% was in a state marine reserve. So this was a huge accomplishment uh, shared by many who participated in the process. It wasn't perfect, but uh, I think everyone could agree it was a pretty good process. Uh, this figure here I put in here for you to um, see where the MPA, MPAs are in uh, Southern California, if you weren't familiar. Uh, they, we have 50 in Southern California. Uh, they encompass about 355 square miles of ocean waters. And uh, so on the left, you can see we've got 19 reserves, 21 conservation areas, and 10 no-take conservation areas, and two special closures, which are out at the Northern Channel Islands. And a side note about this, before the whole Marine Life Protection Act process, the Northern Channel Islands went through a planning process uh, to create uh, protected areas out there. And uh, we decided when we were working in Southern California, we weren't going to change any of that. Um, we kept it how, how it was. And so that's why we actually do have quite a few um, reserves out there. With, before I get into this next section, were there any questions about that planning? Okay. Um, so, far, so far, so good. All right. If I'm going too fast, let me know. Um, so after that process, uh, the department updated the master plan for marine protected areas from a siting and planning document to be a forward-looking management uh, plan. This thing was adopted by the Fish and Game Commission in 2016, and it required the state to establish a management program and implement a comprehensive monitoring program. And that actually was a requirement of the Marine Life Protection Act. And it required uh, us to establish a 10 year adaptive management review cycle from the time the network was completed. So the management program is composed of four components, uh, research and monitoring, outreach and education, policy and permitting and enforcement and compliance. And these four pillars are recognized by MPA practitioners around the world as essential to have an effective program. And so over the next couple of slides, I'm gonna call out a little, a feature of each one of these to kind of give you an idea of what, what's involved in these pillars. So research and monitoring, uh, this was um, based on the, uh, the, mon the master plan, was rolled out in two phases. Phase one uh, involved baseline monitoring that was conducted immediately following uh, the implementation in each one of those coastal regions I previously mentioned. And that whole process in each region took about five years. So the baseline monitoring actually got started a little ahead of the, uh, the updated master plan. And then we uh, created what's called the uh, action plan, which is our long-term monitoring plan that rolled out in 2018 and long-term monitoring statewide took place and is ongoing now. So we, you know, to be cost-effective, uh, we focused in on six core habitats, uh, the rocky intertidal shown in the upper left, the kelp forest, so that's out from shore to 30 meters, uh, Mid-depth, which is from 30 meters out to 100 meters, sandy beach and surf zone, and estuarine habitat is, excuse me, is relatively new. The one uh, circle in the center at the top, CCFRP, is the California Collaborative Fisheries Research Project, and that project bridges uh, the gap between the kelp forest and the ROV mid-depth. This is a pretty amazing program where uh, scientists go out on party boats and they bring volunteer anglers and they fish for a short duration in the reserve at random sites. And then they fish at reference sites outside the reserve to compare the biomass and biodiversity. And this has brought a lot of recognition to the MPA program because a lot of, a lot of the anglers or naysayers are uh, really upset with the marine protected areas, but they've seen the biomass and the massive amount of fish 
they can catch in here when, and then they go out to a reference site. And some of the reference sites are good, but they don't really compare to what's going on in a lot of the MPAs, the reserves. We also uh, partner with organizations to capture ocean observation information to help inform our management. Uh, we've been working with scientists from UC Santa Cruz to develop a connectivity model. Um, they release these uh, theoretical particles at different locations and based on oceanographic currents, we can know where they land. And so that helps us know where the sources and sinks are for larvae and egg to see if the design of our network is functioning as we designed it. Um, and we continue to refine that model. And then we've, uh, over time, have had uh, two human use surveys, one of non-consumptive use and one of consumptive use. So this little video is just a clip to uh, share with you that you can just see some of the field activities um, that we participate in. It's like in the rocky intertidal, thankfully there's no waves. Uh, this is the, the beach survey. We also put brubs out there in addition to the beach staining. It's the reef kelp. And this is the midwater depth exploration. and. This is the uh, CCFRP program, um, and it's just a shout out for the MPA program. So I, I, I inserted this figure, it's a little busy, um, but essentially uh, overall, we're seeing greater biomass and abundance uh, and numbers of fish inside the reserves relative to the uh, reference sites outside. Uh, we're not seeing a big difference in the biodiversity. Um, and in terms of biodiversity and abundance, it is uh, variable from one site to another within each region. So this figure here on the right shows the four monitoring projects, the mid-depth, the CCFRP, kelp forest, and surf zone. And on the far right of this figure is the bioregions that we uh, actively manage now, which is the North Coast, the Central Coast, and then the South Coast has the Northern Channel Islands, because um, they're rather unique. They were established before the whole network, and then the South Coast in general. And the main point here is uh, the dotted line represents uh, neutrality, where uh, the biomass isn't greater or uh, in the MPA or greater in the um, in the reference area. So if, uh, if those uh, dots and stuff you see with the whiskers are on the right side of this line, that means the biomass is greater in the MPA. If it occurs on the left side, it means actually the reference site had a higher, higher biomass. And um, as you can imagine, the North Coast was the last region and it's, um, it's almost a de facto reserve up there because the population is so low and, and fishing activities are uh, localized. So the scatter, the plot there is kind of a little crazy. Um, but I wanted to bring your attention to the south and the northern Channel Islands. And this, um, this is where we're seeing the greatest effect of biomass in the reserves. And this is um, one of the reasons why is uh, where there was heavy fishing before the, the protected areas were implemented, uh, when the reserves go in, it's amazing how fish uh, respond to that and begin to proliferate and stay within these uh, reserves. And as you can see at the very bottom of this figure, um, this combined state total, because of the uh, massive amount of biomass in the Southern California and Channel Islands, it actually, that diamond that's at the bottom of this figure is to the right of this dashed line. It's actually kind of supported the other regions in saying that, you know, overall the biomass is greater in reserves versus reference. But it, there's a lot, there's a lot behind this figure. But I just wanted to share this with you to kind of get an idea of what we're observing across those four uh, monitoring programs. Steve, let me, let me interject a second. There's two questions in the chat uh, from Rob. Uh, consumptive use, question mark. And if what you're asking is, Rob, what is that? It's basically someone who hunts or fishes. Uh, we, we use the word extraction as well. Uh, and if that doesn't answer your question, uh, make another note in the 
in the chat there. And uh, Andrea had a question. Does the monitoring use any data collected by reef check? Yes. Yes, it does. And they're one of our uh, great partners. And um, yeah, so uh, Ken hit it on the head. Yeah. Consumptive is take and non-consumptive would be like bird watching or just photo taking. Um, and I actually have a sheet I can send to Ken tonight or tomorrow. He's heading out of town, but I have a lot of web links to our partners and stuff. If you're interested in getting involved in the program, but yes, reef check is, um, a valued partner and we do use their information and we, we have our, um, we've been downscaling over the years, but we do have, uh, the Garibaldi. I don't know if you've seen it out there when you're diving, but, uh, we take, uh, reef check divers out in addition to our divers to do surveys, uh, in Southern California. So the next pillar, outreach and education, is, is pivotal to the entire program because if we're not effectively reaching out uh, with the coastal community or people visiting the coast, uh, there's no way they can appreciate the protected areas or even uh, know they're in one or even follow the regulations. So we put a lot of effort into outreach and education um, and work with many partners to do that. One of the things we've done uh, over the years is we put um, up to 300 uh, signs along the coastline at Harbor. Some are regulatory in nature and others are uh, interpretive signs like the one here on the left it kind of shows you where you, it's kind of like here you are. And then it shows the protected area and a little uh, life history about that area. We also have a bunch of brochures that have regulations and maps on, on the brochures. We have those in Spanish and English, and uh, we're in the process of getting those also translated into Chinese, Vietnamese, and uh, Telog. So um, if any of you are educators or run programs and you would like some of these brochures or can if you need some at the shop, uh, my email address is at the end of this presentation. You can reach out to me and I can send you some packets. We also updated, uh, we have a sport fishing web app that if you have a smartphone, Android or Apple, um, if you have that on your phone, uh, you it will tell you if you have your location on where, whether, where you are on the coast and whether you're in or out of an MPA. If you're outside the MPA, it'll tell you the current fishing regulations for that specific spot. And then of course, if you're in a conservation area where take is allowed for certain species, excuse me, It'll, it'll tell you what that is. Um, and we want to have an actual app that we're going to uh, roll out here real soon. But um, we've done a lot of beta testing. It's up and sometimes there's been some problems on the backside of the Channel Island, but overall it works pretty good. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we couldn't do a lot of what we do if it wasn't for the many partners we have that help us share the information about the protected areas, uh, highlight the unique features of the localized areas. Uh, one of the big larger programs is called the MPA Collaborative Network. Uh, this program, it basically includes a lot of the people who are involved in the planning process or followed it. Uh, there's 14 collaborators for each of the coastal regions. And th this is pretty cool because there are people that are localized uh, they know what type of information resonates with their communities. Uh, and also, there are usually people who are frequent the beach area or dive, surf, whatever. And they're like our eyes on the water. And um, that's a program, if you're interested, you might want to participate in it. Uh, there's not as many uh, fishing, uh, commercial fishermen or recreational fishermen in that group. Uh, there's a lot of NGOs. We'd like to see more of the consumptive or take people in there but it, it's a good program and reef check is another one of those partners that we have there's also our sister agency the department of state parks uh, they've had a long-term program called parks online resources for teachers and students uh, but we realized through the planning process that there's 35 mpas adjacent to 42 state parks so um the state stepped up and funded the ports program to create lesson plans to incorporate the MPA information into the land base information. And so 
Um, this is remote learning. So in the slide to the, or the image to the right there, uh, that's a park ranger at Crystal Cove uh, in Newport Beach. And they're talking about the life history probably of that lobster. And students can be a mile away or hundreds of miles away, and they can ask questions of the ranger, and she can respond to, to the questions real time. Uh, this was a real hit during COVID, uh, even got some international um, attention. And they've been reaching thousands of students, so we're really glad we're working with them on this. And in the upcoming year, uh, they want to start taking this learning module underwater, and they're going to probably be doing that at Crystal Cove. And um, this little video clip I was going to show you was uh, MPA Day this year. And while it's about MPA Day, they are in a uh, um, Point Lobos Reserve. And you kind of just get an idea of what will probably happen with the remote learning module. As you all know, here at Point Lobos, they have natural reserve and importantly, State Marine Reserve, which is a marine protected area. State Marine Reserve is a place where humans keep everything where it is, right? So our fish, we leave here. There's no fishing allowed here, no collecting allowed here. We leave the habitat alone. And so as you can imagine, those rules make this place an incredible place to go on a scuba dive. To see some amazing wildlife and explore this three-dimensional kelp habitat down here on the bottom of the ocean. So that's what we're going to have all of you join us to today. I'm so excited to have you here. Yeah, so excited, everybody. And uh, we'll be going back and forth between selfie mode here with Nancy. Uh, and I'll do some of the camera work. So if you have any questions, send them over uh, to Erica Topside below to everybody. And on the Aquarium social there as well. Our mission at the Aquarium is to inspire conservation of the ocean. And I can't think of anything better for World Ocean Day than to be underwater in that kelp forest there to show you what is going on right off the back deck of the Aquarium and all along the central coast of California. Yeah, so it's too bad it was a little surgery. The visibility wasn't great, but um, you can see the questions were popping in to the land-based person who could uh, communicate that with um, the divers. So we're excited that they're going to develop a learning module uh, for next year. I think they're going to have five of them. So uh, looking forward to that. Uh, so the next pillar is uh, what we call policy and permitting. And in this pillar, uh, we've uh, taken a lot of action with guidance from the governor's office to be engaged with California Native Americans and trying to bridge some of the uh, heartache that's occurred over the time with tribes. And uh, in some of our conservation areas, uh, we do have exemptions for tribal take. Uh, and though that take does have to follow the current uh, season uh, take limits and uh, the size limits and things like that. And we've also taken like policy action to allow some work in reserves like out of the Channel Islands, Scorpion Pier, that was uh, unsafe. And so they had to move that pier and it's in a reserve. And then out the um, Anacapa, that pier, I think someone actually might have died there. Um, so rash, you know, common sense uh, because of safety, we've allowed these repairs to take place in the reserves. We also uh, issue scientific collecting permits. Uh, we consider these marine protected areas living laboratories, and we want to minimize the cumulative impacts. As you can imagine, with uh, these permits are required for educational and research and monitoring activities. So um, we could love them to death, people going out and educating and then collecting specimens and doing things uh, to learn more could actually have more impact than uh, some of the consumptive activities. So we try to regulate that through the scientific collecting permit program. And just on a side note, like one of our smallest MPAs up there uh, off the Monterey Peninsula um, has the highest number of research activities because you've got Stanford up there and the and uh, Cal State University Monterey Bay and uh, Moss Landing. So uh, a lot of the researchers get upset, but we have to pump the brakes on some of this research, especially if it's kind of doing the same thing and they should be able to piggyback on the other researchers' work. And then, of course, 
uh, enforcement and compliance. If we don't have the enforcement out on the water, the bad actors are going to be out there and, uh, you know, it'll be Harry Carey. So um, we're very fortunate that uh, a few years ago, we created a special uh, marine enforcement uh, division within the department. Uh, previously, our wardens uh, wore many hats, so they might be out uh, like on the lobster opener for a couple of days, but then they'd have to head up in the mountains and do birds and fur. So um, they never really got a pulse of what was happening on the water. And, and we are the lead agency for enforcing regulations. So this was monumental to have this division. We have a wide range of vessels, and I'm excited that in the next year we're going to have a really large vessel uh, to do some uh, offshore patrolling way beyond, you know, out towards the 200 mile limit if necessary. And uh, we do work with allied agencies like national parks, state parks, National Marine Fishery Service, sanctuaries, uh, some of the local um, state park, not state parks, but county parks and some of the law and other law enforcement can write wildlife uh, citations. So we work with them. We also, you may be familiar with the uh, cow tip. Uh, this is a um, anonymous uh, reporting. Uh, you can either call in at that number there or text tip 411, or you can download the app. It's free and it works on Android or Apple. I know um, I've personally received complaints from people in meetings and in the public saying, hey, you know, I saw this via, perceived vi a violation and I called Caltip and no one showed up. Well, um, we've got a lot of words, but we don't have enough. And so sometimes they can't get out there, but we do create heat maps of where these tips are coming in. And that allows us to modify our patrol patterns. Um, and also, while you may not have seen a warden roll out, let's say it's something along the coast, uh, they're there and they're incognito taking pictures, uh, triangulating, let's say it's a boat right near shore, fishing in a reserve, making sure they get the exact position. Um, because when they take these cases to court, they have to have all this documentation to get the prosecutor to take the case and get a conviction. So there's a lot going on that uh, you may not be aware of, but we do appreciate the call in or the texting because we do keep track of where this uh, activity is occurring. And typically it occurs at the same place. So um, that just helps us beef up patrols. And um, this slide right here, I thought I'd share with you. So it's the um, violations that occurred statewide up in the north on the left, central coast and the south coast on the bottom. This is uh, violations in, inside of MPAs from 2016 to 21. And as no surprise, you know, when you go from the North Coast with your low population down to Southern California, the number of violations increase. And uh, this figure is uh, just an enlargement of the one for Southern California. And you can see that Blue Caverns uh, has the highest number of uh, violations. Um, I've, when I get a chance to go out there, I mean, almost every time, I get out there, there's someone fishing in the no-take uh, Blue Caverns conservation area. Um, and it's amazing because, you know, the Wrigley Center and the hyperbaric chamber is just around the corner. Um, so uh, at least we're getting, we're, get, we're citing people for being out there. And then South La Jolla, uh, that's a very public place. So a lot of passionate people uh, besides the enforcement there probably report uh, illegal activities in terms of uh, resource management. And then Long Point out at uh, Catalina is another area where we'd see quite a few uh, violations. Steve, quick question about yeah. the violators. Is, is it a question of we didn't know we were in a no-take area or is it a question of, yeah, we knew we didn't care, we didn't think we'd get caught? Good question, Ken. It's a little of both. Um, I have to tell you guys, hundreds of thousands of dollars are spent in outreach and education. And there's still a lot of people, maybe many of you on this call, really don't know where the MPAs are, or what the regulations are. So some of it is that. In others, um, 
I don't know, I'm being recorded, but uh, some of this is that the, the people that live on the island, they know what the comings and goings are, and so they go there and fish. So it's a combination of both. Um, there's just, there's always those people that are just going to do it no matter what. And then there really is, um, our wardens know too when they pull up on somebody. And so a lot of times they keep a lot of our brochures uh, with the regulations on them and the maps and they ex kind of give them an educational experience. But when they find a commercial fisherman in there or um, somebody that they know of through, you know, their logs that they're a repeat offender, that they, they don't hesitate to write the citations. <clears throat> okay, now that I kind of gave you an overview of why we have the MPAs, uh, the planning process, and uh, the management program, I want to talk a little bit about the adaptive management review cycle. Uh, this, this is at the uh, heart of the program. It's uh, a process for continual learning. And when we learn, we apply what we learn to improve uh, the management of the network. And this simple little uh, figure here describes how the process works. Uh, first, you identify up in the left, number one, the, your management objective or your scientific question you wanna answer because at the heart of this program is the, the four pillars at the center. Then you go out and begin gathering information and conducting your monitoring. And then as you go from number two down to three, uh, you're uh, out there uh, collecting the information, synthesizing, analyzing, making adjustments. And we should be communicating with the broader ocean community and tribal communities about what we're doing and what we're finding. And this ultimately results in a 10-year report of everything that you, we've learned from from the first 10 year in each 10-year cycle. And I, um, I'm really proud of our project and its efforts to conduct the first uh, review of the network and the management program. On the left is a cover photo of the, the document. Um, we we're currently right now using the information from that report to adjust um, our management actions. And uh, this next slide, uh, we'll talk a little bit about this report. So it was an informative report that highlighted our challenges, uh, gaps in our knowledge, our accomplishments. It uh, takes into account our efforts to engage tribes in the broader ocean community about the network. Uh, it also uh, provides information about the broader network performance and how how we're um, if we're meeting the goals of the Marine Life Protection Act. And it includes adaptive management act uh, recommendations. When that's where that star was in the previous slide, uh, the report itself uh, was informed by tribal perspectives. There was uh, several uh, representatives of tribal of tribes got together and provided their perspectives on traditional ecological knowledge, uh, their perceptions on how marine resources should be managed. And so we received that report. Uh, we had stakeholder input from 21 different organizations. And this was like Reef Check so, uh, provided a report to collaboratives, Surf Rider Foundation, sanctuaries. Uh, 21 uh, organizations sent, submitted reports that uh, captured their challenges, accomplishments, and recommendations they felt we should tackle uh, in the next 10 years. And we did do a lot of uh, community engagement and can help with that. And uh, also very important is we had several independent science teams uh, help us with the evaluation of the network. So we had the seven uh, long-term technical reports uh, that collect they um, they were long term reports, but they pulled in data from baseline monitoring that was very important in this first ten years. Uh, we had a uh, science team that developed tractable scientific questions that should be answered to make a determination if the network is functioning as designed, and if not, we've got to make modifications. We had a group also uh, look into whether the MPAs can have some resilience uh, to climate change, which we all know is on its way. 
And then there was a group uh, of international scientists, but many of them are from California, uh, called the National Center for Ecological Analysis and, or, and Synthesis, or NCs. And they pulled all this information together and evaluated the functionality of the network. And of course, uh, within the report was our fisheries information, uh, trends in our scientific collecting permit and our wildlife enforcement data. And of course, there were many recommendations from many sources. So we appreciate everyone's efforts to help inform this report. It wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for the broad, broader ocean community and, and, and tribal communities. So this, this figure is just to kind of give you an idea of how we group the uh, recommendations. They're in three bins, uh, M and we MPA governance, and then we have the MPA management program, and then the network performance. And then those blue bars to the right are the recommendation categories. Uh, and so like things like under governance, tribal coordination, uh, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. Um, those are types of things in that bin. And then in the management program, of course, is the pillars. And then the network performance. Those are some of the uh, broad recommendations. Each one of these, well, all of these recommendations here, there's 28 actually in the report, uh, resulted in 82 action items. So we're going to be buried over the next year uh, dealing with uh, how we're going to handle these uh, action items. So that takes me in closing to this timeline of where we were this year and where we want to be next year. Excuse me. So we re released the public to the public the report in January, and we officially transmitted it to the commission for their February meeting. In March, we had uh, several public meetings. One was up in Monterey. We called it an MPA forum. I'm not sure if any of you uh, participated in that. It was an opportunity for those who have been interested in the program itself and the report to to learn about, we shared information about it. There were tribal perspectives and it was an opportunity to provide public comment. And then the following day, there's a group called the Marine Resources Committee. That's a subgroup of the actual commission. At the same location, they held a public forum where people could make on the record comments of uh, what they liked, didn't like, uh, concerns they have about the MPA's uh, impacts to their life. It was a whole range of uh, public comment. And then that information was shared with our Fish and Game Commission in April of this year. And they made a decision to ask the department based on the uh, recommendations, the 28 and all the action items, they asked us to group those recommendations into near term, which is ongoing to two years, uh, three to five years for midterm and five to 10 years for long term uh, to bend those recommendations like that. And um, that doesn't mean like for the long term ones, we're waiting 10 years to do something. We just might not have the information available to us uh, to implement some of these recommendations. And then the um, in subsequent meetings after April, we had further discussions with the commission and um, they did. They rolled out a petition process. So they the commission has a process that anyone at any time, any organization, individual can submit a petition to the commission for a change to regulations or specifically to MPA regulations. So they developed, and that's in regulations. So they had to develop another document. So it didn't look like an underground regulations that provided specifics for the high volume of petitions we are anticipating uh, to come in. So they, finalize that and um, they've asked the public to uh, submit their petitions using the form they have on online at their web page by November 30th uh, for consideration. So the commission, I don't know how they're going to do it. So they're going to get, so they'll get them officially in December of this year, they'll have to go through them and their staff and then have those available in 2024, February uh, to, tell the department which petitions they'd like us to focus on. 
And then after February, um, my staff will be involved in evaluating those petitions, looking at the data, uh, looking at the rationale to see if it makes sense. And then later in 2024, we'll come back to the commission. Uh, there'll be probably meetings in between there with their Marine Resources Committee with our progress and some of the findings that we have. Uh, and then eventually this will probably result in some type of rulemakings in 2025. And Ken's no stranger to this. I know he wanted to get the, the casino state marine conservation area changed. Oh, shoot. I forgot his name. Dr. Bill, Dr. Bill Bushing. Yeah, Dr. Bill Bushing. And so um, they had a policy of like every three years um, that they consider, I think it was three or five, right? Five. Ten, five five name changes. So. I'm sure you got that on your calendar, but um, if if you are, if you have a particular reason why you want to see a change to a protected area or, or add protected areas, you can go to the commission site and find this information. I have a whole list of web links I can send Ken and he, the QR codes and he could send them around um, if you're interested in that. And, and so with that, I just... Uh, want to thank you all for dialing in. I know this wasn't a presentation with sexy underwater fish and all that stuff, but uh, it's important information. And if you didn't know about MPAs, I hope you learned a little more and you can share that with, with your colleagues and dive partners out there. And if you want to snap a photo or snap that QR code, it'll take you to our webpage where you can learn more about California's marine protected areas. And, and I'm available for any questions that you might have. So, Steve, the first thing I'll do is have you stop the share. If anybody needs okay. to the email, I can give that to them. Then the second thing we'll do, if you watch everybody's picture, we give you the traditional Zoom seekers thank you. <laughs> because we have them all muted, so we just have, have them do that. Um, there's, a, there's a question from the chat from Tom Turney, who is with the Catalina Conservation Divers. From the perspective of outreach and education, is data gathered available to other researchers, and if so, how do you get how do you get it? Is there a metadata schema on the data available? Yes, there is. So, all the funding that's happening for the um, uh, for the monitoring activities uh, has been funded by the Ocean Protection Council. Uh, the baseline monitoring was funded by voter approved bond funds, and uh, a lot of that was for baseline and then long term monitoring has been funded through something called once through cooling. It's mitigation for the discharge of the power plants. But because the Ocean Protection Council has been dispersing those funds, they have uploaded all of the data to something called Data One. And um, I can provide Ken with that link. But if you go on there, all the metadata, all the data, all the reports that are written are all stored there. And that, that node is available to anyone in the world. It's used by a lot of researchers. But that is the site that um, all of our data in this program is located. And the link I can I have, I can send you, um, takes you directly to the MPA data that's been collected. And so that's in what's called data, data one. So it is available. So I think that was John. Um, so I'll, I'll get that with the other QR codes to Ken and uh, you'll have that in case you wanna check it out. Cool. And, and I, will, I will just tell you guys, you know, it's it's interesting in this process because it, it's the type of thing I've been involved in a lot of different levels of it. And, you know, one thing, if you get involved in this, that, and I don't mean this in a, a bad way against Steve, but the whole structure is very bureaucratic. So the idea of, hey, I see a problem. Can we fix it tomorrow? A lot of times that that's not the way it works. So so my question to you, Steve, is what do you what's the biggest challenge you're finding in terms of getting public buy-in to the way all of this works? It's seeing those results, you know, the monitoring results. Um, like I said, the, like the anglers uh, that go out on these uh, charter boats, and I have a QR code link for that CCFRP, and you can get on their web page and get out on a charter boat. It doesn't cost you anything. They provide all the fishing gear. Um, but those anglers, when they see the abundance of fish and diversity, that it just blows their minds. And a lot of the people who were naysayers, there's actually, they conducted a survey of people before they went on this program 
and then afterwards and their total opinion changed. But it's we're, we're really struggling, Ken, to tell you the truth in terms of trying to reach as many people as possible and share the information. I mean, I can't tell you how much money has been spent by the state and um, philanthropic organizations to share the word. But, you know, there's just so many people and it, it's just hard. It's hard to get that out there. So, you know, meetings like this, you know, or this group, you know, when they go on a diet trip and they're with 10 people and they share this information, that's 10 more people. But um, we, we are currently evaluating all the various outreach tools we have and trying to find out what what is the magic ticket, you know, that will resonate most with uh, people. Like some of our signage, we had a group go out and observe people when they came up onto the signage. Most people just walk right by it. The only signs, you know, even that ter- the interpretive panels are beautiful. But most people just want to see what can I take. And so they like that we got a little brown one that either says no take or you can spearfish or whatever. They'll pay attention to that. But other than that, they don't, they don't pay attention. They just walk right on by it. And so unfortunately, a lot of the education comes from our enforcement, you know, and you know, and they're not out there rabid dogs giving tickets left and right. They try to do an education event. And then, you know, when they know someone's a repeater, especially a recreational person who, you know, out on the water, don't even know where they are. You know, they probably just left the port and go a mile down the coast. They're a little lenient on that type of thing. But if anyone's got a suggestion, we're open to it because it's, it's, a, it's a tough one um, to do. It, it it is indeed. I mean, I can testify as part of my involvement in the decadal management. I have a mailing list of I want to say about four hundred dive shops, dive clubs, and you know, I'm sending stuff out to them, and you know, we're getting it out. But at some point, people say, "Oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't know about that." And you go, "Well, I I emailed you all that information a week ago. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I didn't didn't have time to look at that or whatever whatever it might be." So. Yeah, it's Who's dedicated got, people like on the call. I mean, here it is, eight, eight o'clock, eight thirty at night, and people are willing to hopefully, you know, they got something out of it and they can share that information. But uh that's tough. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And as the saying goes, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make <laughs> it drink. So what are you gonna do? Who else yeah. who else besides me has a question for uh Mr. Agronic? I can always count on you. <laughs> You see, great great presentation. presentation. Thank Thank you so much. I'm out on the dive boats pretty frequently, and I know the dive boats are very good about this because they will always say this is an MPA or it's no take, you know, uh, you you know, be very, very careful. So they're very respectful. Um, When I looked at your your charts on the violations, it seemed like the highest number of violations was... uh, uh like 451 maybe in five years which if my math is correct is like one every four days or so for that particular site and that doesn't seem in my mind too bad i was wondering i mean do you feel like people the public in general are respecting the mpas it's working pretty well i would i would think so there's one of the programs that we have is called mpa watch and this is a group that walks on beaches. Uh, they, it's passive. They don't interview anybody. They just, they got a sheet and they write down everything they see that happening on the beach. And then they write down proceed violations. And whenever I look at all their pie charts, uh, Ill- at least from the beach, it's nominal. There's really no one, no one like illegally fishing from the beach. Now diving's tougher, right? Because someone could enter outside the protected area and swim into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but they try to document that. And, and that program does kind of demonstrate that uh, people are following um, following the regulations. Um, and then we actually in L.A., uh, there's a guy, uh, he's in the Watermen's, L.A. Watermen's Alliance. And um, he goes out in a boat and he, he brings disadvantaged students and stuff. And he comes up on our words on our little uh, well, they don't like it too much, but because he'll come up on somebody in a reserve that's maybe fishing and he has brochures and he'll say, hey, do you know you're in a a no take, you know, fishing area? And he hands it out, but you know, a little worried that 
could get him in trouble with someone that doesn't appreciate that. But yeah, it, you got to think though, with the, the warden force, it's so nominal. I mean, compared to like an LA police department that, the stats that you were just kind of thinking about, Jim, um, what's happening when they're not there? You know, um, we kind of an interesting story it was pretty sensationalized. It was a couple of years ago where a charter boat fisherman, you know, party boat captain actually took paying passengers knowing that they were going to go out to the reserves out there at the Channel Islands. And the department had heard about this. So they put a couple of the younger wardens out there uh, paying passengers on the boat and uh, they're they're bringing in the fish and uh, they're purposely fishing in the reserve. And then they called in a patrol boat that stayed way outside of radar, you know, and they came in. So there, there are definitely bad actors, but most of us, right, we just want to try to do the right thing. Um, but there are some of those crazy ones, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Who else has a question? And by the way, we have a note. Andrea, you want to get closer? We can see your vintage uh, Chamber Day 20, uh, 2004 sweatshirt. We don't do those anymore. Does that have anything on the back or just on the front? I'm making her, I'm making her exercise. There you go. Oh, yeah. Okay. That was a, that was a note in the, in the chat, probably from Wendy. So we figured we'd we don't know that. Who else has a non-chamber day question for uh, for Steve? Well, one one thing I was going to bring up, kind of yeah. linked to one of the previous questions, is um, you know the governor is pushing this uh, thirty thirty. It's uh, part of Joe Biden's uh, "Make America Beautiful," where thirty percent of terrestrial habitat has to be protected and thirty percent of the oceans, and so. Um, a lot of the public feels like, you know, we have 16% protected right now. And they're like, oh, so now you're going to create more protected areas to get to 3030. And that was not the purpose of the 10 year review it was totally insulated from it. Uh, we, we at the department don't have an intention to create more protected areas because we're still learning how it's working. You know, it'd be really just at, just do it a disservice to start changing things. And we're just kind of now getting the pulse of it. Um, but uh, there, there's that dis, uh, disinformation out there. And uh, I know I think the governor is going to be leaning on sanctuaries. You know, we got like three or four here and off the coast of California to step up some of their uh, regulations to be more. Um, a lot of it's more like mineral mining or discharge, but they don't really have a lot of natural resource regulations. But try to get them to step up to get us to 3030. But I just want to be on, on record saying we have no intent of increasing the size of our existing MPA, but there are going to be a lot of petitions, uh, people on that 3030 wagon that are going to want more reserves uh, along the coastline. Very good. Anyone else got a, a question, a burning, a burning issue in your mind? Or just a smoldering issue in your mind? Apparently not. Well, very good. Well, once again, let's do the Zoom Seekers yeah. Traditional yeah thank, thank, you. thank you guys thank you steve uh we we appreciate it and again if you got any uh any questions for steve or anything you know you can send me stuff and i can relay stuff to him and back and forth and i'll obviously have limited email for the next two weeks because i'll be traveling but uh but we can always relay stuff uh, as as it were our uh december zoom seekers meeting is going to be photo based uh, Doug Schloss, who used to be the um, photo pro for the Palau Aggressor, now based in Colorado um, with his wife, who was also on the Palau Aggressor and their kid. Uh, but just we talk about, uh, you know, with general stuff, how to make better photos and um, how to tweak them better once, once you take the good picture as well. And that will be on Tuesday, December 12th. So we hope you will uh, you will join us. Join us for that. So for now, that'll wrap everything up uh, for tonight. Uh, Steve, thank you again very much for joining us on all of this. And uh, as always, we thank all of you guys for spending some time with us at Zoom Seekers. Have a lovely evening. And um, I will now do the thing that I always do at the end of these, which is it's nothing personal, but I'm hitting end meeting for all, which kicks everybody out. Take care, Great. everybody. Bye. Thanks, Steve.